that's what happens when 65 years ago or 60 years ago I jumped from airplanes. I was a paratrooper and I pay my knees. I, I get shot in my knees. That's why for the first time, actually last week I spoke at Quigley, also a Catholic school, for the first time asked for a chair. How is everybody here? Good. Before I start, they came for us. Whenever I say they, I mean the Nazis, the Gestapo, Nuntai. I can see the whole crowd. I don't want anybody to have a neck ache. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to stay, OK? They came for us noontime. Why did they come noontime? Because noontime was lunch hour. In Europe, not just in Hungary, where I am from, generally in Europe, lunchtime was the big meal of the day in the evening, and there was a little siesta, and they went back to work. The work finished after, a, uh, I would say, 8 o'clock, they went home. They may have some yogurt, some cookies, but the main meal was lunchtime. So they knew, the Nazis knew, that every Jew is going to be at home having dinner. So they came for us at lunchtime. And indeed, we could hear them from far away because they were using goose steps. You know what goose steps are? Real loud. Um, I mean, you could hear them from a kilometer or something like that. And we heard them. We lived in a raw house, although we just bought a brand new uh, a town house. We didn't move in yet. <coughs> but anyhow, we lived right in the middle of the raw house, across from the synagogue. A, uh, my parents were probably the biggest donors to that synagogue. So there were about 30 or 40 of them with a couple Nazi a, uh, lieutenants. They were titled. And then you had a couple Gestapo sergeants. I'll be talking about the Gestapo a little bit later. And they stopped in front of us, in front of our house, Using a gramophone, they yelled and screamed 15 minutes, everybody out. You take out only your valuables and one change of underwear. And sure enough, we were in 15 minutes, we were out there, and they started to walk us to the train station, which was right next to the brick factory there. And we were waiting for a train. See, there was a big fight in Germany between the Wehrmacht. You know what Wehrmacht is? Wehr is war. Macht is to do war. That's their name. And just to do a juxtaposition, the Israeli military is IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. We don't start wars. We just defend ourselves. Sometimes we preempt when we know that they are going like in 1956. Unfortunately, I lost my brother, one of my brothers in that war. So anyhow, <coughs> and they marched us first through the main street of Debrecen. Debrecen was the second largest city in Hungary, 178 or 79,000 people, and there were about 7,300 Jews in Debrecen. So they were rushing us. Not th and, uh, and then we were joined. By the way, this picture that you see, it's a shame it's not on. Oh, it's on this side too. <laughs> OK. This was right after we were liberated by the Americans. And you can see a big skull, little body. And you didn't see my stomach, but a big extended stomach. Those are the signs, the signs of deep, deep starvation. 
for a long, long time. You know, I usually add, you know, that stomach, I got to give some credit <laughs> to Eaton Park. <laughs> In China Palace. <laughs> but it doesn't mitigate the fact that we were very, very close to that. And you'll see a little bit later on. You can move to another picture. Who's, uh, who's in charge of the pictures? OK, because I brought, I think, five pictures. My name is Abram Judah Summit. I picked Judah because Judah was, yeah, this is after the war. Yeah, this is fine, yeah. So this one stays? Huh? Keep this one? Yeah, yeah, and then put another one, yeah. Okay. I picked Judah because in history, around 2,250 years ago or so, Judah was one of the sons of Mattathias, who was the high priest in Jerusalem. Israel was under the control of the uh, Byzantines. Alexander the Great conquered the Middle East, conquered Egypt, conquered parts of India, northern India. But he loved the Jews, because he said the Jews were the only ones that he conquered that were intellectual. The rest were completely illiterate, all the other countries. So, uh, but he wanted to turn the Jews into Byzantines, and many of them went for it. So Metatias, and by the way, they went into the temple, and they built a statue there, and that really got him. So he got his five boys, and they created an army of about 300. They were actually partisans of the old age, maybe the first ones in history. And Antiochus, who was the leader of a, you know, a, uh, as he was dying, Alexander the Great, he divided his empire into three. And there was one in the south, starting probably from around Israel all the way into Egypt. Then he had the middle one, and he had the third one who was in charge of the islands of, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, where he came from. So Judah was the organizer, and the enemy came with 40,000 people and elephants. Now, trying to get to Jerusalem, you've got to go through gorges, the hills of Judah. You know, you can't climb up. So Simon, with his javelin, went, in, went under the first elephant, and he stabbed him all the way to the heart. He gave his life. He sacrificed his life, and that stopped them. They couldn't continue, and the 300 came down from the hills, and they were killing and killing. Finally, they all ran away. So they won that war. And that's the war that we celebrate Hanukkah. I don't know if you know. Yeah. If you heard of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is two words, Hanukkah. Hanu rested on the 26th of the month. It was, was over. And they went into the temple, they rededicated it, and they found only one little oil bottle that was supposed to be for one day, but a miracle happened, it lasted for eight days. So that's why we celebrate that holiday. So anyhow, I was born February the 5th, 1938, in Debrecen, Hungary, to an Orthodox Jewish family. I don't know if you guys watched the, uh, the speech by uh, Donald Trump. I'm sure some of you saw, saw me there, mm -hmm. and he said that it was my birthday on the 5th. And they started to sing the uh, yeah. happy birthday. And one of his top advisors told me, this is, you made history because it has never been sung. Yeah. <laughs> in the thing there. And uh, another one, also a top advisor, sold, told me, you united America for two minutes. <laughs> Republic, there was no Republican, no Democrat, there were only Americans. So that wasn't my fault. <laughs> so anyhow, I was the third son. My, f my following, uh, uh, following my bro oldest brother, Moshe, and my brother, Yaakov. Moshe is one of some feel in Israel that he is the giant of our generation in Judaism. And my brother Yaakov, who I told you 
I lost in the Sinai campaign, Gamal Abdel Nasser decided to close the exits and entries into Israel from the sea. So they had no choice. They went after him. First they destroyed the Air, air Force. Once they destroyed the Air Force, the rest was very easy. My father Yekutiel and mother Rachel operated two knitting factories. We were prosperous and had a good life. And I got to tell you, a good life for Orthodox Jews. We were very Orthodox. It's not a box in the soccer game, in the soccer arena. It's nothing going to all the museums and seeing the movies. No, it's going across the street to the synagogue and praying and studying. And that's what we do. And that's what we did. In 1945-41, the Hungarian government allied itself with Hitler. It was a kind of puppet-puppeteer relationship. This allowed the Aerocross Party, a rapidly nationalistic and anti-Semitic organization, to enter the Hungarian government and control it. When I see the Aerocross, it has nothing to do with the religion. They were like MS-13, like the worst of the worst. And Hitler loved them because they were killing Jews. They were killing also other minorities like gypsies and so forth. But the main thing, they were killing Jews. They told the Jews, don't go there. The Nazis are there. Come with us. And they followed them. <coughs> they took them to the Danube River, which is a huge, huge river. And it starts with the Rhine, actually, and then it becomes the Danube. And they had them taken off, take off their shoes and line them up and shot them in the head and threw them into the Danube. In fact, Israel is just negotiating with the Hungarians to allow Israeli divers to go and find whatever they can find in the way of bodies, ske probably skeletons, because for us to bury the dead is very, very important. In fact, you know this tragedy, a tree of life, of which I'm a member, I'm the one who was four minutes late, but I got caught in a fire line. You know, being an ex paratrooper, I had to see where the shots coming from. So I looked, I saw him three cars away from me. He was shooting at the detective. I know he didn't see me because he focused on the detective. But I became the number one witness for the FBI. They already interviewed me four times, and I get letters every week if I need anything. Of course, if I need, I won't ask them because they won't give you anything. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, you can take this away. Thank you. So anyhow, Hitler forced the Hungarians to put the arrow cross in the government, and they controlled the government, actually. And they enacted the same laws that Hitler enacted in Germany. They enacted in Hungary. A, uh, first of all, Hitler wrote in his book, actually, that when he becomes chancellor, he's going to hang the Jews on telephone poles until they stunk. Then he would take them down and replace them, because there were plenty, plenty of Jews. There were 275,000, some say 500,000, among 40 million to 50 million Germans. So this is still nothing. But he used that excuse. And the re why did he turn against the Jews? He lived in a Jewish apartment building in Austria. He was born in Austria. His father, he didn't know his father. His mother died. So a Jewish woman, two stories up, raised him. She took care of him. He was a very talented painter. He could have become a major painter. He used to go down to the paint store that was owned by a Jew. They all liked him. They say he was a very nice kid. So the Jew told him, once you paint my store and I'll pay you. So you'll have some money. But you know, when a tyrant wants to start a tyranny, there are cert certain things he has to do. First, he has to take the ammunition away from everybody, except for his own people, those who protect him. And secondly, he has to discover an outside enemy to hate. And he knew that the entire Europe were anti-Semitic, very anti-Semitic. In fact, today, they became anti-Semitic again. 
Maybe it's because of all the Muslims they took in. I'm not so sure. But the situation in Europe, especially in France, is very, very bad for Jews. And, mil and uh, many of them are wo moving to Israel or coming to the United States. So the Jew laws had been enacted in Germany because they became also the, the, the laws in Hungary. It precluded the Jews from all professions, such as doctors, lawyers, engineers, plumbers, a, uh, bricklayers, any kind of a profession that you could support your family with. They were not allowed to do. Their movement was restricted to street cars. Now, cars, I doubt very much, 80 years ago, many people had cars. Maybe the super, super rich. The, their property was taken from them. You want to put it there? Exactly. Okay. At the same time, beatings and killings by the Aero Cross became endemic. One night, my father was on his way home from work. He was attacked by a gang that included one of his factory workers. Shortly thereafter, he got us all passports and tickets to America, where we had family. We would not get the opportunity to leave. He went to the Dutch consulate, who was between Germany and America. And they, <coughs> by then, America didn't have relations with Germany anymore. Which one was this? One and this is two. Okay. Sometime in late March, early April 1944, during lunch hour, we heard the sound of goose steps moving up our street and stopping in front of our house. We heard a voice using a megaphone, barking out loud comments, ordering us to assemble outside within 15 minutes. We were told to leave everything except for our valuables, our papers, and some change of underwear. We collected those and carried them out in a small suitcase. We saw the Gestapo a, accompanying a platoon of Hungarian gendarmerie. Gendarmerie is like the state troopers. You had police in the city, but the state troopers were the gendarmerie, very, very anti-Semitic. They killed a lot of Jews, too. The entire Hungary was like that. We saw Gestapo accompanying a platoon of Hungarian gendarmerie. They heard us by yelling, screaming, pushing, shoving, and beating, marching us to the rail station. It was a cold and rainy day, and many couldn't keep up with the pace. Just imagine, you know, seven, a, a 17 tons some, and then Jews from the surrounding area around the city were another 6,000, you had about 13,000 Jews there. And they, and uh, you know, when you take a population of 13,000, one third are old, one third are young, and one, one third are in the middle. Now, of course, the old and the young cannot walk fast. So, so parents picked up their little kids, as many as could. And the, the elderly, if they couldn't walk fast enough, we saw them with a, like a two by four or something like that. And we heard the thump. We heard the thump. They were dead. We couldn't see them because we already passed until we got to the brickyard. At the station, we were joined by many more Jews from the countryside. My mother volunteered to cook for the masses. Can you imagine? She came from a wealthy family, but she was always an activist. She was always first to offer her services. Of course, she wasn't by herself. She had help. She was provided with bed tops, vegetables and potatoes, and a small amount of beef from local farms for which we paid. Four bed tops. They were cooking every day. They made soup. That was the fare for the day, for 24 hours. We got one slice of bread, a little bit of soup, 
And that was enough for 24 hours. Until the transport trains arrived. So the starvation had begun. One meal a day and barely any food is not going to carry you for more than an hour or so. But this was for 24 hours. 24 hours. We expected two transport trains in several days, but perhaps a week passed before the first train arrived. These were cattle car, cars used for moving livestock from one place to another. I don't know if anybody here was on an Amtrak train. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I always use it to go to Philadelphia to visit my daughter and my kids and my son-in-law. But this were there was a gap between the planks. Sometimes, you know, you have those buttons in wood. Mm -hmm. They didn't cut out because cows wouldn't go through anyhow, which means that in the summer was very hot, in the winter was freezing, like being in a freezer. My aunt with her six children started to leave. Her name was Berta. She had seven children. The oldest one was immediately taken with his father to a labor camp because he was old enough. But she had the seven children, the six children. My mother begged her not to go. My aunt said she could not stand the constant crying from her children due to, due to their hunger. What do children do when they are hungry? They are, they are crying. And she just couldn't take the crying anymore. They all got on that first transport, tra transport train and left, never to be seen again by any family. Unfortunately, they made the destination and they were all killed. When I came to America for the f first time, I met my cousin, Shire. He was half crazy. I stayed with him. I couldn't stay with him because he woke me up every two minutes. You're making noise, you know? So, so I left. And then I told him I want to see my uncle. He said, you can't. He's in the institution. You don't want to see him. I mean, you lose a wife and six children. A few days later, a second transport train arrived. It was similar to the other cattle cars. My mother was being used as an interpreter since she could read, write, and speak fluent German. Now, how does an Orthodox woman speak German? Orthodox Jews, Hasidim, the real Orthodox, don't believe in educating their, their women. They have two places at home, in the bedroom where they make the children and in the kitchen where they feed them. They raise the children. That's all. They know how to pray, they know the prayers, and they know a little bit Bible. But my mother was not like that. My mother was an intellectual. She wanted to learn. So she and her mother ganged up on my grandfather, finally allowing, him, allowing her to go to gymnasium. Gymnasium in Hungary or Europe was the equivalent of two to three year college. That's how high it was. That's how, I <coughs> excuse me, that's how she learned fluent German. She, since she could read and write and speak fluent German. On the platform, she stood next to the, next to the commandant. He was accompanied by a sergeant in a black uniform, the official dress code of the Gestapo. The Gestapo had all black, and skulls were their buttons, skulls. They had two skulls here, and they had those boat cats. They had two skulls, one skull on each side. That indicated who they were, what their profession was. They were professional killers and torturers. In fact, Hermann Goering, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, who was second only to Hitler, if something happened to Hitler, he would become the leader. He gathered 50,000, taking, taking them out from the worst prisons in Germany. They were all murderers, pedophiles, bank robbers, anything you can think of in terms of being terrible. He gathered them, and they were protecting Hitler. And they were also killers. Later on, when the final solution came, in, uh, when they decided on it in Germany, in a, in a mansion that's called Vinci, uh, he enlarged it to 500,000. Their job was the final solution, kill every Jew. Not just here, in England, in the US eventually, 
all over the world. So my mother noticed that they were putting two buckets in each car. Buckets, those were the maybe two gallons, maybe three gallons at the top. Farmers used to milk their cows in those. You know, it has a handle, and they, uh, one was filled with water, and the other one was for toilet use. Now, they put like 80, 90 people in each car, obviously standing room only, you couldn't make it to the toilet, so you just let it go. The cars, they were about, I don't know, uh, 2,700 some people, there were about 175 cars. So uh, a, uh, the entire train became one big toilet. But by then, we lost our sense of smell. We couldn't smell. Now, there was no one bucket for women, one for men. But modesty has disappeared completely. There was no such thing. Neither was lust. When you are that hungry, how can you lust after anything? So one mitigated the other in some respect. In her most respectful voice, my mother addressed the commandant, telling him that she knew where we were going and that this little bucket of water wasn't going to make it because we were going to Auschwitz. Surely you won't want the population along the way to witness the brutality of the civilized Germans. You have to remember, German until Hitler came along in 1933, they were the most educated country in the entire world. Well, I would say the Western world. Okay? They won half of all the Nobel Prizes that year. U.S. didn't have one, a single one. Now, if I ask you, the Jews won 37.5% of that. If I ask you, can anybody name here one June, Jew who won the Nobel Prize? His first name is Albert. Albert Einstein. In fact, they wanted to give him another one next year for chemistry. And he said, no, one is enough. <laughs> give the other one next to me. He's a genius. <laughs> he didn't care about money. He sent all the money to his wife. They were separated, but they had a child. He didn't care about money. He didn't care about fame. In fact, he went to Israel. Ben-Gurion brought him to Israel. Ben-Gurion was the prime minister those days. And he was among the founders of the Hebrew University. And then Ben-Gurion asked him if he wants to be the chancellor. He said, no. Then he asked him if he wants to be the first president of the state of Israel. No. All he liked to do, he was in Princeton, lay in bed with a bunch of papers, writing all kinds of formulas. He wanted to find the final solution for everything, how the world was created, how the universe was created, that's what he was working. Unfortunately, he didn't lo ling lo uh, live long enough to finish. But he was very, very humble, and he was a very nice guy. So anyhow, what happened to the Germans? How do you go from up there all the way down? In every human endeavor, they were number one. Music, mathematics. Uh, technology, anything that human beings are interested in, they were number one in those days. And to say that Germans had nothing to do with it is BS, you know. The vast majority of Germans supported Hitler, especially after the First World War, where they lost and they were embarrassed. It was revenge. Anyhow, the Gestapo sergeant unholstered his pistol, pistol and he put it to my mother's head, ready to fire. A Jew was not permitted to address it, uh, the Germans unless spoken to. There was a direct order by Hitler. If a Jew opens his mouth, you shoot him on the spot. No questions asked. Now, if you ask him a question, then he can answer the question. So the commandant intervened, admonish, admonishing the sergeant calling him an idiot for not realizing that by killing my mother they would be losing their interpreter as well. She was the only one who could speak German. And her German was higher probably than the commandant himself, who was an officer. By the way, officers in Germany, they were on a higher level than the Gestapo. The Gestapo was on the lower level, even middle level. They were 
many of them very aristocratic. They came from the aristocracy. So anyhow, he called that the sergeant, you idiot. You dumb cat. Next, we saw the replacement of the water bucket with an oil drum filled with water. They herded us into the cars, about 70, 80, sometimes even 90. It was just about standing room only with no food. We were on our way to Auschwitz. The trip would last several days. Now, there was no need to, to feed us because once we arrived in Auschwitz, within 50 minutes, we would be coming out of the smokestacks. You know, they made the selection. They picked a few women to do their laundry, uh, sew buttons and stuff like that. And they picked some men, maybe 200 men or so, to take care of the cap, to keep it clean, and so forth, and so forth. And the rest were taken immediately to the showers. That's what they said. But water, you can't, you, you gotta have water. You can't be without, without water more than maybe 48 hours stops. You dehydrate and you die. And they didn't want to drop the dead in Czechoslovakia. That's when we, we went through. And Czechoslovakia was between Poland and, they, uh, and, uh, and Hungary. Uh, in Poland there is, on the eastern, I'm sorry, on the western and southern port, there is a little piece of flander, and that's where uh, Auschwitz was. So I would say uh, the distance between my city and Auschwitz was like between here and New York, something like that. Today's trains making one day, those days, the tr it would take the trains maybe two days normally, but since the military had priority, sometimes we had to wait for a military train to go through, sometimes it could be two, three, sometimes eight hours. So it would take about three, four days to get. And that's what saved us. Otherwise, we would have made Auschwitz. So anyhow, in on the way, Czechoslovak soldiers, not soldiers, partisans, blew up the railway. Mm -hmm. And they had no choice. Hungary didn't want us anymore. So they took us to Austria and divided the cargo among manufacturers. We were dumped in a, in a large uh, lumber yard. The owner uh, was a major Nazi. Every time he passed by the Jews, he opened his shirt and he had a swastika on his entire chest, tattooed on, tattooed on his chest. Don't forget. Hitler was an Austrian. He was born in Austria. So they went with him very willingly. In order to supplement our diet, my mother, after a long day's work, would sneak out to a nearby farmer's village and barter for food. She would ask him, get a needle and get yarn. She would knit clothes for their babies and in return receive milk, eggs, cheese, and some bread and butter, not too much because the farmers were afraid too. This was a very dangerous enterprise for had she been caught, she would have been shot, the farmers would have been shot also. Hitler also gave an order to all Germans and, Austri and Austrians not to deal with the Jews. The same orders. You deal with a Jew, you get killed. One night, a few weeks later, my mother did not, yeah, I meant to tell you that my mother was so good with her hands. She could do anything. She's the one who started the knitting factories. And she taught my father, who was a genius in scholarship, in Judaism. But he was a very fast learner. He, fi he learned how to fix the machines, which are very complicated. And usually he would call some engineer from Germany, and they uh, didn't want to do that. So he learned how to do it himself. And they, so, she made them clothes like they have never seen in the world. They were like sexy things. Because our factories were manufacturing very high-end knitting dresses for women. In Europe, they were in the winter. The well-to-do women, the aristocratic women, wore knitted dresses. 
You don't see it here in this country today, and maybe not even in Europe anymore. Because it got very cold in Hungary. One night, a few weeks later, my mother didn't return as usual. We had no idea what might have happened to her, and we were worried sick. Panic set in. Without my mother, we were doomed. She was like an eagle, spreading her wings, covering and protecting us. Although she was only 4'10", she stood 10 feet tall. She was our heart and soul. You have a picture of her. This is after the war. She was a beautiful woman. She had three qualities. First, she was beautiful. She was the, a, uh, you know, the hourglass. <laughs> when it came to smartness, she wasn't just smart out of the box. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman. She could speak several languages. She's the one who created our business, and she's the one who taught my father everything. And the third one, she had a lot of guts. She was fearless. One of the things that I inherited from her. I said, the only thing that scares me is when I open my checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, nothing else. <laughs> but, but anyhow, she showed her fearlessness when she talked to the commandant about the water. She knew that she's going to get killed. But she figured if she doesn't do it, many sick people would die anyhow. And beside the point, we'll be in Auschwitz a day or two, and we'll all be dead. So it was strategy. She always strategized everything. When she was a teenager, like 15, 16 years old, her father, my grandfather, used, used her as a collector. At the time, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. He bought a business, made some money, sold it, got into something else. Supposedly, he had the first gas station in Hungary. And they, uh, at the time, he was in the wholesale food business, and he supplied all the grocery stores with merchandise. And he had one client who was so anti-Semitic that when he came to the store to collect, the guy opened such a mouth on him. And in Hungarian, you have more curses than the rest of Europe. He could go on for a half an hour without repeating them. <laughs> and my grandfather, it came to a point that my grandfather was afraid to go to collect. He thought he's going to kill him. So he sent my mother, 15, 16 years old. My mother walked in, she put her hands behind her back, and she started looking at the shelves. The guy knew who she was, so he started raving and ranting and cursing. <coughs> she didn't listen. She taught us, don't ever listen to words. Let them fly over your shoulder. Watch their hands, because they can kill you with their hands. My mother was like that. Another thing about my mother, my mother never, ever raised her voice. Always spoke to everybody with tremendous respect. But between my, my sister said, between speaking so low and looking at you, you didn't want to do that. You know, my mother never raised her voice on us. If we did anything wrong, she would call us to her. I remember my father chasing my brother Yaakov around the dinner table. He could never catch him. <laughs> my mother happened to be home because she was most of the time on the road selling our, you know, products. But she was home and she, she heard that thing going on. She went out to say, Tibby. He lowered his head and came straight to her. He didn't mess with my mother. <laughs> now, very lightly, he didn't mean to hurt you. That was the punishment. Then she said, now what did you do? We were afraid of my mother not physically being beaten up. We were afraid to disappoint her. Because when she was disappointed, we not. And that was the worst feeling in the world. Because we knew that my mother loved us with every single cell of her body. She would lay her life down for us. In fact, I spoke at uh, Shadyside Academy, and there were a couple of girls giggling. I didn't say anything. Before I finished, before I left, I said, I know that some of you here have problems with your mothers. 
You have, at this age, you have issues with your mothers. And it's understandable. But remember, the only person in your life who would give a life for you is your mother. Not your father, not your grandparents, not your uncle, not your brothers, not your sisters. It is your mother who would gl gladly give her life for you. And I got a letter from one of the girls there. I get, usually I get letters, but not always. And she writes to me that she had a lot of issues with her mother. But after my speech, she went home. She found, looked for her mother. She found her in the kitchen. Where else will you find a mother? <laughs> find her in the kitchen. And she grabbed her. She hugged her. And she kissed her. And she told her how much she loved him. She loved her. That's the only pleasure I get out of talking when I hear stories like that. So that was my mother. My mother was unbelievable. Uh, you know, it's, uh, she was a giant. Not to me, to many people. When we came to Israel, when we, after the war we came to Israel, there was a big debate whether to expect compensation from the Germans. And my mother said, Ratzachta <coughs> begami arashta, thou murdered and thou inherited too. You know who said it to whom? God said it to Cain when he came. Where is your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said to him that his blood is screaming at me from under ground. And he also said, God said to him, Aratzachta, you murdered and you want to inherit his too? So that's what my mother said. And beside the point, what about my two factories, my two homes? Who is going to pay for it? The Hungarians wouldn't pay because they claimed that their communist belongs to everybody. So Hungarian Jews never got compensated. Jews in, the East, in Western Europe, and in Sweden, and uh, you know all the other countries, they got compensated penny for penny. And there was a woman in Israel, I remember her father had a factory with 5,000 people. She was getting, first she got $150 million, then she was getting like a million dollars a month. You know, the, the Germans paid. So anyhow, as I said, she was 10 feet tall, she was our heart and soul. Some days went by, then one evening she returned, telling us that she had been caught and put in jail. She never explained how she managed to gain her release, and we never asked. Many years later, at the age of 84, we buried our beloved mother in Jerusalem, and along with her was buried the secret that saved our lives, and I believe that they, uh, uh, she just told me, that I used to go to Israel every year or bring her here for a couple of months and she stayed with my sister Miriam here. And they, uh, I used to squeeze some stories out of her <coughs> and she said that the Germans sent a squad with a lieutenant who was like Hollywood handsome, so was handsome. And there is nothing my mother wouldn't do to save us. I surmise, it's not for sure, we wouldn't push her, we wouldn't ask her anything about it. Not long after our mother's return, a transport train arrived and the Germans loaded us into it. It was bound for Bergen-Belsen, concentration camp in northern Germany near Hanover. It was early summer when we arrived in Bergen-Belsen. By this time, it had become a full-fledged death camp. By the way, that train was the second death train I was on. I was on three death trains, because we were supposed to die in Bergen-Belsen. Although there were no gas chambers uh, as at Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, Helmo, many other ones, they had seven killing factories, they were all in Poland. There are 2,000 concentration camps in Germany, some in Austria, some in Romania. Now, all of, not all of them were places uh, uh, like Bergen-Belsen. Many of them were manufactured. They, they used Jews to manufacture their planes, their tanks, uh, and so forth. And I think most of the camps were like that, because 
they needed a lot of ammunition, an airplane. By this time, it had become a full-fledged death camp. Although there were, there were no gas chambers, as Auschwitz, Treblinka, or other ones in northern Poland, it was still a death camp. By the way, Auschwitz was in southern Poland. Just using different methods of killing. It was starvation method of reducing daily portions, which killed you. What happens is, when you are starved, deeply starved, the first thing to go is your immunity system. And if your immune system is gone, you can catch anything. The ensuing weakness made you vulnerable to diseases like dysentery and typhoid that hastened your death. Typhoid was the worst killer. It killed my father. Two days after liberation. My grandfather had it too, but he survived. Go figure, 25 years older. Somehow he survived. Hygiene was so lacking that the barracks were inundated with lice and other parasites. The lice were biting day and night. My mother's solution to this problem was to have us eat the lice. Didn't, she didn't order us to eat the lice. She convinced us. She said that we were just taking back what the lice had taken from us. Lice are blood suckers, and blood is protein. And protein will keep you alive, or at least help you with the other stuff that you have to stay alive. Alive. So after two, three lies, it became very common, very normal. You know, pretty soon you are going to celebrate the Last Supper, which is Passover for us. And there are the ten plagues. And the third plague, Dams for the Akinim, Kinim is lies. And I'm very perplexed. I don't know if to be happy about it, because lice saved our lives to some degree, at least part of it. So as I said, I'm perplexed about that. But there was so much lice that we just kept eating on all the time. People were dropping dead regularly in all places. Many people just gave up, lay down and died. Every morning at the gate to the camp, there would be piles of corpses two to three stories high, about 800, 900, maybe a thousand, maybe even 1,200. They would be cleared away only to be replaced with fresh corpses the next morning, and so on, and so on. By the age of seven, I have seen more dead than life. And I lost all regard for death, for dead people, completely. There was another boy in my age in camp that I paired up with. We were always foraging for food. Very quickly we learned to follow German officers coming out from their mess hall. Now their mess hall was like a five-star restaurant. They had a lot of money, they had our money. You know, when you have, what, 13,000 Jews, they took everything away from you? There was some serious money there. So, whenever they went to shop for them, they bought the best of every champagne, steaks, anything that you can think of on a 50th anniversary or something like that. I don't know, we don't even do that on our 50th anniversary. So, they were always chewing on something as they left, and we jumped on what they discarded on the ground. Usually, you know, they were chewing on a, maybe a wing, maybe a piece of pork, something that you chew on. Usually there was not much more than a taste, but that taste lingered enough to enjoy it. And always compare it to, your, to whoever makes a soup and takes a spoon, a little teaspoon, to taste it, to know if, this, if the soup is getting ready to be done. That was our feeling in our mouth. It filled our mouth, just the taste of it. It supplemented our once daily ration of a handful of rock-hard black bread and some warm water that had some color to it that was supposed to be soup. Now that's what we got every day. We got about a medium-sized grapefruit of rock-hard black bread 
and a, a little bit colored water. Now, a lot of people were so hungry that they finished it. They finished it, they dropped it. First of all, the stumps were completely shrunk. Everything went down straight. The camp itself was like a toilet. But the Germans appointed what they called the Judenrat, the Jewish committee, whose job was to keep the camp clean, to clean and they, to take care of everything. And uh, they picked them for their brutality. They were very brutal. I could say there was some mitigation because the Nazis were watching them. If they were not brutal enough, they have plenty to replace them. There was no problem. So they were very brutal. And many of them after the war were caught and killed. Revenge. Not by the government, by people who suffered under them. But as long as there was something on the ground for us who cared. Remembering my mother said, don't listen to the words. The words won't kill you. Look at their hands. Because they could easily kill you for any little reason whatsoever. One day I complained to my mother about a bad headache. I never complained about anything. I'm not a complainer. I live with it. My mother checked my head and a large swelling around an abscess on the back of my skull. You know what an abscess is? Pus. Fortunately, one of the detainees in our barracks was a physician. He had his black doctor satchel with him. You don't remember those things because you have RG care. You, you can go to the emergency room. But those days, there was no such thing. There was a hospital. Usually, a doctor came to you with a satchel. In his satchel, he had things for minor things. He had all kinds of instruments to take care of you. Maybe you broke a leg or a hand. Or maybe you had a gush of blood coming out. So he had all this. But at the time my mother took, there, took him, she didn't have, he didn't have any of that stuff anymore. After examining my head, he told my mother that the abscess was very bad and that it penetrated my skull. He added that he couldn't believe that I was still alive. Starved with all that pus on my brain. How did I, how, did, how was I like, I guess, my will to live was so strong that nothing, nothing could affect it. This doctor said that he would have to clean all the parts from the abscess, cut out the parts of my brain on, on my skull, which had been destroyed, it was about the size of a silver dollar. and take the pass out, as he lacked anything to put me to sleep or even dull the pain, he asked my mother to hold me tight so I wouldn't move when the pain became unbearable. When he finished, he showed us a metallic dish the size of a cereal bowl filled with pus. Usually, you see those metallic dishes in hospitals. And I was filled to the top with pus. And he cut out that, and I wish to God I had a chance to thank him. But I don't know, I mean, he may have been at the time probably 40 or so, and I was seven and a half going on eight. So I never got a chance. The doctor again apologized for not having any painkiller. My mother thanked him and then took me to our bunk. When your stomach has been empty for so long, how much can a little headache count for? I, I always say that there is a line between your brain and your stomach and the rest of the body doesn't matter. A dog can actually chew on your toes and you wouldn't even know it. That's how bad it could be. But I was alive. He did a tremendous job. The thing never grew up back this way. It's like that. I have a gorge there, about three inches long, half inch deep, half inch wide, and then it goes down towards my right, another inch or so. Never had, never bothered me. In fact, last week, first time, I had a little pain there, but it never bothered me, ever. In April of 1945, 10 months, after 10 months in Bergen-Belsen, the Germans began again to load transfer trains to transport several thousand us to another camp. Now, that would be the third death 
the first to Auschwitz, second to Bergen-Belsen, and this was the third one. Our mother packed us on the train. Now, it was a death train. We were traveling for many days, perhaps weeks, stopping only periodically to unload the dead. An older fellow next to me, and I'm not sure he was old, maybe he was only 20, 25, but he had a stubble, he had a, a, a gray sweater and a black thing on it, and he has been dead already for about two, three days, since the last time they came and they took the dead. So this time, the train stopped and they removed the body. This angered me as I had just lost my cover and my pillow. It didn't mean anything to me. Just another dead person. Maybe that's why I'm dedicated mostly to my family. Just my family. So after a time we awoke one morning to find the doors to the transport car wide open. When we started with the train, there were German soldiers with the anti-aircraft machine gun. Because there were American airplanes or Canadian or British airplanes surrounding all the time. They did not know if this train was m moving ammunition to the front, to the east against the Soviet Union, to the west against America, Canada, and England. Those were the three. So they kept swirling around. So they didn't bomb it. They went away. They were not sure. Haltingly, we left the train and discovered that the Nazi guards were all gone. The train had stopped in the middle of a forest. By the way, when the soldiers were gone, they were replaced with the Hitler Jugend. You know what Jugend is? Youth, from 12 on. They were the best soldiers of Hitler and the worst killers. Hitler loved them. You must have seen, if you saw any show about the Munich trials or anything about the Nazis, you always see them standing and he you know, actually you can see that he loves them and they loved him. But they disappeared too. All the Germans disappeared. From the darkness, we heard a loud, uh, yeah, we heard a, a loud rumble. Not knowing what to expect, panic took over. This, we thought, would be our final destination. Here is where the bastards would slaughter us all. Sure enough, we spotted a tank crawling out of the woods, and it came closer to the train. So we knew that they, the, the turret was not aimed at the train. We knew right away that something is strange. The hatch opened, and a soldier had popped out. As he rose, we could all see that his uniform was different from the Nazis. And my father yelled, Americans. This is what the president repeated in his speech last week. That, Mr. that Judah's father yelled, Americans, Americans. And he, he got a standing ovation from everybody for that. Because I mentioned America actually helped. And then the crying, yelling, and cheering began. The celebration went on for a long time. We were saved. We were liberated by the Americans. We reboarded our transport train and traveled for a few hours to Hillesleben, a large town on the Rhine River, where the river was deep and wide. We could see that the bridge crossing the river had been bummed out. Clearly, this was the final destination the Nazis had in mind for us when we were herded onto the train in Bergen-Belsen. They were going to push the train off the bridge into the river with the car doors locked tight. There would have been no way out. Indeed, they did that, not just to trains. They put Jews on the way home after the war. They put them in big, a, uh, they went to the farm, and the farmers usually had those big, uh, what do you call it, uh, buildings. They filled up the building with 300 Jews, and they set it afire. To them, the war against the Jews was not over. They wanted to kill as many as they could, as they could. Of course, they were all executed, you know, eventually. 
In Hitler's life, my father and grandfather contracted typhoid. The disease was rampant among the survivors, and many thousand died. My father included. Fortunately, my grandfather survived. After a time, the Joint Distribution Committee, an American Jewish welfare organization, separated my siblings and I from my mother and grandparents and uncle, and we were taken to Paris. There we stayed at the Grand Hotel, a five-star hotel. The French media made a big deal out of the four of us. So anyhow, I don't know if you know papers like Le Mans, Le Figaro, and some other major newspapers. They were right plastered on the front page. They made a big deal out of the four of us as we were the first children to be freed by the Americans. Later, we were moved to a pension, which is like a boarding house or a small hotel. We were reunited with our family. There, they fed us up, working to help us to overcome the effects of the starvation we had endured at the hands of the Nazis. We left after a few weeks and soon arrived in Marseille, which is a large port city in the Mediterranean, that means southern France. We were looking and feeling much better, and in a few days we boarded a ship and embarked on a voyage that ended in Israel. Now, we had tickets to come to America, but, but with that regard to you guys, uh, yeah, three, uh, three generations later, my mother said, no more goyim. You know what goyim is? No more Gentiles. So we went to Israel. And by the way, the Hungarian government sent a uh, so-called emissaries to Paris to find Jews who operated factories. And they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to operate them, especially in eating factories. And my mother said, yeah, two knitting factories. Well, why don't you come back to Hungary and activate them? And she asked him, who's going to own it? She said, we are a communist country. Of course, the people will own it. She said, goodbye. And we got on the ship. And we went to Israel. And they so anyhow, we arrived in Israel. When we arrived in Israel, it was the late summer of 1945. My grandfather left the ship, and when he set solid foot on ground, he fell to his knees, kissing the ground and thanking God for bringing us to this point. We all joined him. It is a moment that I will always remember and cherish. I know you all call Israel the Holy Land because of Jesus. But to us, the land is actually holy. If you walk three steps in Israel, is we did a good deed. You don't have to do, you don't have to give charity, you don't have to do anything. If you just walk in Israel, you committed mitzvah, a mitzvah. So it was a big deal for us. At the insistence of my grandfather, my, my two brothers and I were put into an ultra-Orthodox institution and my sister was sent to Orthodox orphanage for girls, never mixing boys and girls, ever. It was terrible for my sister. My mother, however, was a more modern thinker, fought her father over our placement. She fought again and prevailed. We, based, we boys were moved to a moderate Orthodox orphanage in Bnei Barak. It was it's about 15 kilometers from Tel Aviv or 10 miles, something like that. And it's a very old city because it's mentioned in the Bible. B'nai Barak is actually mentioned in the Bible. And there was this big seminary for, uh, to prepare people for rabbis or just to be scholars. Many boys here had survived the concentration camp, but that's a little exaggerated, but mostly they were hidden children those who had no surviving families upon arriving in Israel. These boys were given Hebrew names. Now, who were the hidden children? Did you ever hear the term hidden children? Okay. Now, there were 3.1 million Jews in Poland. That was second only to the United States. The United States, about 5 million or so. So anyhow, they all knew that the Nazis are coming, those who had families. 
And what they did, did you show the picture? Yeah, it, well, it just went out. How about, got it back. how about before the war? This one? Don't, well, this is when she was 15, uh, 15 or 17 years old. You can see she was a pretty woman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, I don't think you had a picture with my mother. With my father, that was before the war. That's the only picture we have of my father. Yeah, I can't see it. Is it there on the side? It's okay. So anyhow, <laughs> so the hidden children were what happened that out of the 3.1 million Jews who were taken to the camps, n over 90% were killed. Maybe 95%, you have it? That's the only picture of, of, uh, uh, I have of my father, and of course the cutest one is right next to him. That's more. I was 14 months, my sister was about two months old. Mm -hmm. And you can see my mother is still a little puffed, mm -hmm. you know, from pregnancy. The middle one with longer hair is Yaakov, who got killed. And the older one, Moshe. By the way, her Hungarian names were, I was Imre, Yaakov was Tibi, the big one was Polly, and my sister was Marian. My mother was Irene, it's like Irene. They called it Irenke. And my father was Kalman, Yekutiel, and uh, his Hebrew name was Yekutiel. My mother was, of course, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Moshe was Moshe. <laughs> Yaakov, and I was Judah. Avram, Yehuda, Abram, Judah, but I picked Judah. Yeah, you can leave it there for a while. By the way, I forgot to tell you that when my mother was in prison, there was a German girl, a, a Nazarene beauty. She was between 18 and 25. What did she do in jail? So my mother was talking to her, German and so forth. Hitler gave a direct order to all the beauties in Austria and Germany to entertain German soldiers coming home on a furlough for the Russian front or from the Western front. Austria is a Catholic country. She came from a very good family. And she wouldn't do it. They put her in jail and they hung her. The officer allowed my mother, she convinced him. She had this persuasive way of persuading. You know, you couldn't say no to my mother because she was so respectful. Says, I have my, my husband's sick, I have four children to take care of. So he let her go quick to go and be with us. Otherwise, she would have been killed too. So anyhow, going back to those hidden children, after the war, very few came home. And unfortunately, the Poles also were killing them. They didn't want to, especially those who had Jewish homes, they didn't want to give up the home. So they just killed them. But not many came back, maybe, maybe 100,000 or so. So those who had the Jewish children didn't know what to do with them. So they went to the priest. The priest didn't know what to do with them, so he went to the bishop. The bishop didn't know what to do, he went to the archbishop, who became later cardinal. And who was he? The Polish pope. And he said, send them to Israel. They, they grew up Catholic, they speak only Polish, and if they want to come back to Poland, they'll come back on their own when they're 18 years old. Not one of them ever came back. How did they find out that they were Jews? My rabbi, you know, went to Poland and he asked one of the convents to allow and talk to the children. And at first, the, the, uh, what do you call people in the convent? They are regular, uh, sisters, huh? sisters, nuns? No. Well, actually, yeah. Well, in that case, it was a man, you know. And he didn't want to do it. But finally, he said, give me five minutes. So he gave him five minutes. And he went in, and he started to sing a Jewish lullaby. And they all turned their head. All of a sudden, they realized they were all Jews. So then, obviously, they couldn't keep him, and he took him to Israel. And that's what my, my uh, uh, that's where I was with them. We gave them names, you know, uh, Jewish names. And uh, for the first six months in the orphanage, we were fighting, bloody. Because we didn't understand each other. But after six months, we started learning Hebrew. 
So we became one group, and we used to fight the Israelis who were born there for maybe two, three generations. They always looked down on us, and we didn't like it. And I always used to say, if you fight me, kill me, because I'm going to kill you. So I became kind of the head of the orphanage. And finally, after a while, I said to them, look, why are we fighting all the time? Why don't you, the head of your group, fight me? And whoever wins, wins. So anyhow, <laughs> he pulled on me. He pulled the first one. Instead of him fighting me, he sent the heaviest kids <laughs> in the school. He was about three, four inches taller than I was. And I weighed maybe 75, 80 pounds. He weighed about twice as much. And we were rolling and rolling. I ended up in a ditch and I couldn't move him anymore. <laughs> so I put out my hand. And from that moment, we became the best of friends. We never had trouble with them anymore. They understood. So I was there for five and a half years. In five and a half years, I went to a high school seminary. Six, six, six hours a day, five, six hours a day, we were studying the Talmud. You know what the Talmud is? Okay. The Talmud, you have the Bible. The Bible is, uh, it's not easy <coughs> to study. Yeah. And then you have the Mishnah explaining the Talmud, also not easy. And then you have the 24 tractates of the Talmud, which explains everything. In fact, the uh, Judeo-Christian, a, uh, a uh, what do you call that? Uh, the Judeo-Christian culture is based on the Talmud. And some saints, you know, who were, a, uh, not all saints, uh, you know, were intellectually endowed, and they were religious, you know, and they did all the other things that Christians do. But uh, you had the what, saint, what's his name? Uh, name a couple <laughs> who, who wrote, well, you know, you had Gregory, Gregory the Third. Gregory the Third is the one who actually created the Christian Church, mm -hmm. and he had actually an African bishop. And the African <coughs> bishop said, him, "What are we going to use for music?" He said, I "Told him go to Jerusalem, and whatever was in the temple. There was a lot of music in the temple. We'll copy it. So you have our music, and we have your <laughs> music." <laughs> So anyhow, life in the orphanage was tough. The boys had came from every country in Eastern Europe. The place was a true babble with everyone speaking, and I already told you that, so there is no need to, to fill it up. Personally, I was filled with rage. They could not control me. They were always looking to send me to a juvenile delinquent home. But steady intercession and lobbying from my mother kept me in the orphanage. I lived there for seven, well, actually five and a half years. I don't know where I took seven and a half, until the age of 14. After finishing eighth grade, my mother convinced the government to put us into a seminary high school named Midrashiat Noam. It was an exclu exclusive and pricey institution. My mother and I were poor, my brothers and I were the poor kids there as we were wards of the government. My mother actually convinced Ben Gurion, the prime minister, that we belonged in that school because of where we came from. So that's where we graduated. The food and lodging were excellent, and so was the curriculum. Of course, we didn't learn a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, where they learn about the human body. No? Biology? Biology. God forbid yeah. an Orthodox Jew should see biology to see the body of a female. So that was out. It was a four-year program, and by the time I graduated, I had lost my rage. I also learned how to make a little money, a lesson I shared with my brother, Jakob. He liked girls. He dated girls. He was 12 months older than I was, but he didn't have any money. I liked to make money. 
and I gave him everything I made because I had nothing to do with it. I prepared Jewish boys for their bar mitzvah. I got paid. And also, Orthodox Jews won't carry anything on Sabbath unless the camp is surrounded with a line. Mm -hmm. And the line is connected with the telephone line, not the electric line. And I checked it every Friday, for which I got 20 lira, which is like $20. And I gave it all to my brother Yaakov. Always. I didn't need money. During those years, you know, we are in Israel now. My mother remarried. My stepfather was a man who had lost his wife and three children. I'll be talking about him a little bit. He had a good heart, but was filled with rage, much like I had been. But he worshipped my mother, and they had two children together. Intellectually, my mother was above him, maybe five steps. He was a he had a huge bakery. He supplied the entire town in Romania with bread and the, those, you know, baked goods and so forth. And they, uh, he was very handsome. My mother was very, you know, she was in fashion. She created clothes. Mm -hmm. So she was very conscious. She didn't like anybody with a big nose. She didn't like anybody with that hair. <laughs> and they, uh, yeah. and they, but she was a wonderful woman. He worshipped her, and they had two children together, a boy named Itzik, who is in Jerusalem, and a daughter, Miriam. It was good to have a little sister and brother. It was a revelation to me that life continues, that life conquers death. Because every time, this, I, I kind of finished my story, but I want to talk about three people. Every time somebody is born into my family, like my brother Moshe, the older brother, has four boys and 16 grandchildren. Every time, or my sister Miriam had two daughters, and, they, and every time somebody is born into my family, I point to hell and say, you son of a bitch, you. You thought you're gonna finish, you finish the Jewish, uh, the, the summit family. We are growing and prospering. My brother's boys, the oldest one, Kuti, is a psycho psychologist. Mm -hmm. His brother, Yaki, now Yaki in Israel doesn't mean what he means here. Yaki is Yaakov, <laughs> short of Yaakov. Yaki is a, a vascular surgeon, and he's also on the transplantation team in Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. The third one, Hanoch, is an entrepreneur. He invented a couple of things for a, Agriculture, you know what a pod is? You put a seed in it, and then you take care of it six, seven, eight weeks, and then you put it in the ground. He created a pod that's food, and he created a non-corrosive glue that you can eat, that keeps it together. I tried it, it's, it's like cement. <laughs> it's, it's so hard, I'm telling you. But he, he, he's now with a, a uh, with an actually French conglomerate mm -hmm. and German. The German wanted to steal it, he didn't succeed. But the French are working together with him. He's the chairman of, the, uh, of this business. My, wa my, 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 my daughter, because I don't have a wife, together we bought 1% in it. So, uh, well, he gave us from his shares. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very good. I'm the only one in the family that had money. I'm in the jewelry business, but the jewelry business is not good. Nobody's getting engaged. <laughs> if you don't get engaged, you don't buy engagement rings, wedding rings, anniversary rings, or anything like that. So I, I would say maybe 30% of jewelers in America went out of business in the last year, maybe even a little bit more. So, uh, so anyhow, a, I love to share with my family. You know, I remember my mother asked me when, I brought it to America. I said, Judah, why are you so good to me? I said to her, I'm good to you, Ima. If I could, I put you on Rushmore together with those presidents. <laughs> you belong there. If I did for a thousand years what I do, wouldn't be enough to what you did for me and for us. And they, uh, that was my mother. She was a very unusual human being. She was not just unusual women, but among 
an orthodox society. She had more brains than most of them. My father was a genius. And my brother in Jerusalem is considered the giant of our generation in Judaism. At the Hebrew University, of course, he retired many years ago, but he's there all the time. And he writes essays on law, Jewish law. People from around the world, rabbis, ask him questions, how to apply a certain law, and he writes an essay on it. He researches it, and he sends it to it. And it's in South America, Germany, all over. And they, in fact, I just talked to him a couple of days ago, and they, he said, I saw you on TV twice. <laughs> <laughs> and they, and I ended up, I said, Moshe, I love you. And he said, I love you, Judah, you know. We are very, very close as a family. When I was in the orphanage, and I was maybe 10 years old, I walked into the orphanage, and I see one of the counselors was disciplining my brother Yaakov. You know, with a hand. So I came quietly behind him. I jumped all the way to his neck, and I started pounding him from both sides. He couldn't get me, like as if I was a little monkey, you know, <laughs> which I was, which I was. He kept pounding me. He, threw, he couldn't get me down. And I yelled, if you ever touch my brother again, I'm going to kill you. And I ran away. I ran home. Of course, that was a mistake because my mother grabbed me and took me right back. <laughs> <laughs> and she apologized for everything. And they, uh, so that was the story. Now, let me tell you, first of all, a, a British writer by the name of Dumbledore. Now, what happened in Bergen-Belsen? We were not in Bergen-Belsen. We were in Germany near Hanover. The British were fighting there. The war was over, but a lot of German soldiers didn't know that. So they kept fighting. So they were mopping up. All of a sudden, they see a man in a white coat yelling, medicine, medicine. So they didn't know what to do. They are soldiers. Do we leave the battle and follow him? But he was so convincing that they followed him. And before they even arrived to Bergen-Belsen, the stench was so gripping. And they kept coming. They, come, they came to the, to the gate. Of course, they saw uh, all the skeletons. And there were 13,000 skeletons spread all over the camp. You couldn't walk without walking, without touching one of them. And then there were 13,000 more who died within a day or two. Because the infrastructure of bread and water, food and water, disappeared. The Germans, most of them, disappeared. So, so anyhow, a, uh, they got into the camp, and they found all these people. And then even Eisner wanted to see it. In England, they didn't believe it. So anyhow, this Dumbledore, his name was Dumbledore, wrote that if all heavens were paper, all the trees in all the forests, all over the world, in the gardens, were inks, and all the waters in all the oceans, and the rivers, and seas, were ink, wouldn't be enough to describe what I've seen in Bergen-Belsen. It was so bad. I saw the Munich trials on public TV here, and they wanted to show the German degradation. And they wanted to show it a concentration camp. And who did they show? They showed Bergen-Belsen. I don't know if it was the worst of the worst. They were all bad, very bad. But you know, when they don't feed you and they don't give you water, I mean, what worse than that can be? So uh, here's one. The other one is Frank Tars, who was an American lieutenant who followed our train. He just died last year. He was 99 years old. And uh, I remember he told me once, he came from the South. As such, he probably was an anti-Semite. Because those days, anti-Semitism in the sun, they thought every Jew had horns. Because they saw the picture of Moses, you know. And they saw Moses with horns. Actually, God endowed him with part of God himself. So he was actually light. There was, no, there was not a horn. So anyhow, Frank Tars was a lieutenant, lieutenant, a liaison officer. And he said, he told me that, he, how did, actually he called me, he asked for the number of my sister's daughters. So I was anxious. What is he asking for? 
So I called him, he had his phone number, and, and he told me, I followed your train. I sent a tank. And we didn't know if you were, who you were. So we kept following until the end. And they, uh, then we discovered you were, we opened a train, you all came down, many of you died on the train, three, four hundred were dead. And they, we de lost you, and then we took you to Hillersleben. Uh, I told you about Hillersleben, a, 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 you know, a big city in Germany where the Rhine River went through, was very deep, very wide, and the bridge was bombed out. So that's where they were going to kill us. And, they, uh, and Frank Tars became a, uh, a speaker on behalf of of the Holocaust, what I'm doing now. And he did it in England, he did it in Israel, in some other countries. And I kept in touch with him. And when I saw him, uh, I saw that movie in the Munich trials, every once in a while they stopped and they talked to him. That's the first time I actually saw his face. And then I, co I kept scrolling down and I see Frank Tars passed away. So I called his wife. She was two years younger than he was. And I told her, I just saw your husband, and uh, she wanted so badly to know where. I said, I can't tell you, but you check Frank Tars and scroll and you'll find him. So, uh, and the third one was my stepfather, Moshe Schwartz. My mother married him after the war. Now, Moshe Schwartz lived in Romania. He had a very big bakery, and he, br and he made bread for all the grocery stores in his town, in his city. He knew that the Germans are coming. So he took his children, he sold everything he had, his home and his bakeries. He took his children and gave it to his neighbor, next door neighbor, save my children. The Germans came immediately, they divided men and woman. The woman and the elderly, they put immediately on the, on the truck and never heard from. But the three children survived. Mm -hmm. He thought that they survived because he gave them to his neighbor. And on the man's side, again, the German asked anybody has any profession. He said, I'm a baker and I also cook. So they took him immediately and put him in the kitchen, the officer's kitchen, in a concentration camp. I don't know exactly where. So anyhow, he was baking every morning they would put him on the back of a truck. In the front, you had a German soldier and a, and a Romanian driver. And the German soldier had lots of money. They went to the market, and he bought the best of everything. Again, steak, champagne, salami. On the way back, they always went, they always drove slowly by the fence. There were always about 20, 25 people working on the fence, repairing it because the fence was electrified. And at night, Jews would throw themselves on the fence and commit suicide. They couldn't take it anymore. You know, if you know that every day is going to be the same, why suffer more? Nobody ever thought that they might survive. That thing didn't exist. So as he was passing them, he would throw down a salami. He would throw down a piece of bread. He would throw down a piece of cheese. He would throw down some fruits, never too much, so that when he got back to, to the restaurant for the, uh, and there was an inspector there, he would know that some stuff is missing. So anyhow, in Israel, years later, my grandparents lived in Jerusalem, they lived in Tel Aviv, they came to visit him. In Jerusalem, you have some names named after the British, because the British, you know, they ruled the entire Middle East. So that name of that thing was a hill going up King George. They are going up King George Street and they are passing this restaurant that was very boisterous. There were three or four men at the door with big glasses. You could tell that they were, I mean, they could tell that they were a little bit, what do you call, fashnuchket, you know, <laughs> a little drunk. Fashnuchket, learned that. I think it's in Polish, I'm not sure. So anyhow, one of them yelled, Maurice Schwartz. He turned around, he didn't recognize them. So they kept going. This time louder. You know, drunken people can go pretty loud. So my mother said to him, 
Moshe, don't you, aren't you interested in all these people? Now they, they seem to know you. Don't you want to know who they are? So he went back and in a very respectful said, gentlemen, I don't remember who you are. I don't know who you are. And they said, we know you. So, you know, we thought he may have been with the Judenrat, you know, those Jews who took care of the camp. Because they never talked, never mentioned anything about his first family. My sister in Pittsburgh has a picture of him, his three kids, and his wife. And she asked him for the names. He wouldn't give, till today she doesn't. She took a trip back to Hungary and Romania. Nobody remembered. So she has half-brother and two half-sisters. And she doesn't know the names. So anyhow, <coughs> they said to him, you don't, you don't remember us, but you remember the salami? You remember the bread? You remember the fruit? If you saved about 200 people, when you consider that we, sh we shared it with our families and so forth. So as much rage as he had, that he took it out on my little brother, he had a golden heart. So what I say to kids, when you go to a liquor store, don't look for the best, the nicest bottle. It's probably the worst wine, <laughs> you know. So a... Uh, So he turned out to be righteous. My mother wanted to leave him because he was not good with the children. He lost three children. In fact, I think I was at the time a soldier. I was a paratrooper. I came home because I never were at home, you know. Uh, uh, orphanage and this. I never had a childhood, okay? I grew up when I was six and three months old. I became a man. So anyhow, I came home on fair law or something like that, and I saw him beating up my brother. So I separated them. And I said, what are you beating him up? What, do you want to kill him? You lost three, you want to kill another one? And I said to him, you know, he didn't mess with me. I, said, I called him Father Abba. See, if you ever raise your hand on him and I see, I'll take you apart. And I said, why do you do it? He said, I don't know. He really didn't know. So. That's my story. Thank you so much for listening to my story.